So this is going to be st uh, stopping SDR relay and replay attacks and uh, uh, on passive key entry systems. So who in here has heard of these or seen them in the news or yeah. <laughs> who in here is one of the fancy push button start cars? Yeah. <laughs> Makes it even more that more interesting. So this is something where I'm going to go over uh, a little cool device that I built. Um, after I did a relay attack it was two years ago uh, when I got my original uh, Edison 210 so I'll go into a little bit of that. A little bit about myself, uh, 32, I work for NCR and I live in North Dakota. Uh, I've spoken, this is my fourth year at DEF CON speaking, Black Hat last year, uh, speak at a lot of ICS, con or ICS security conventions, things like that. So, and I've been doing pen testing, this is my 13th year professionally and I've been doing programming for about as long and I've just gotten into a lot of research, uh, anything radio or car related has been kind of my focus on the last year um, and I did um, a lot of attacks on ATMs and point of sale systems uh, last year. So, and reverse engineering malware is uh, one of my uh, remaining hobbies and that's one of my original hobbies, that's how I got into reversing is actually uh, tearing apart the Chernobyl or CIH virus. It was the one that reversed your BIOS if anybody remembers that one. It was several years ago but yeah, it's a very good time and uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm going to do the car hacking village here. So this presentation, a um, little bit about the research. So last year, uh, about two years ago actually, I uh, looked into a amplification attack that um, some people in, um, I believe it was in uh, another country in Europe. Uh, I need to sleep more, obviously, but uh, yeah, they're definitely. <laughs> uh, they were uh, did an amplification attack, so they actually boosted the frequency and were able to send it a certain amount of distance. Um, and last year, I received uh, three Edis uh, U310s or U210s and uh, one N210, which is the one on the right there. And uh, so I had four software-defined radios, and I was like. What's the, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> and I was actually looking at um, a mobilizer bypasses and uh, dealer, older dealership tools. Uh, I was getting into, so I've been doing car hacking for about, uh, this will be my third year. So it is something where people can pick it up really, really quick, especially with some of the stuff that you can Google nowadays. A lot of the kits that are out there, it's just the price to enter point has gotten a lot cheaper uh, compared to what it was. So, and uh, yeah, this is an actual pile of 433 and 315 megahertz radios. So I'll actually be going into, how to build the device on, I have a demo lab on Sunday, so if you guys want to come and see how to build the device, then I can go into a lot more detail uh, once I hear back from uh, Ford on the actual TPMS sensor also, so. So there was a Swiss, Swiss amplifica uh, amplification attack, um, there was a couple researchers and they actually did the, there's several changes that actually went into a lot of the automobiles at that point. And uh, from 2011 on, um, they started putting multiple sensors, they started um, dealing with, um, actual delays and tracking a lot of that, there was a huge window, it was literally uh, a third of a second for some of the original stuff, now it's down to about a tenth of a second where you can actually relay uh, the actual signal. And uh, does everybody in here kind of understand the concept behind how the relay attack works for the most part? Okay. Yeah, this is actual uh, passive key entry systems or uh, did a lot of research also around 2014 on passive keys, so that's when I started looking at the, uh, what, what they're actually speaking, what range is there, I looked into stolen vehicle slowdowns. Um, uh, I also had a DARPA contract and DHS contract with um, uh, their attacks on PSAPs and E911 centers. So I started looking at some of the auto automotive uh, automatic uh, notification for crash detections. So if airbags were deployed, if vehicles rolled over, because that is something that uh, these messages might be able to be flooded into a call center and stuff like that. So it's something where that uh, came across as a lot of our um, stuff. So and yeah, that's pretty interesting research, and I will definitely be going into a lot of the actual uh, passive key attacks that we have here. So 2015 I submitted a, uh, or actually did the DSP for samples up to 700 megahertz. So the only keys that I wasn't able to do at that time were BMW and Ford because they are a higher spectrum than that. And that was just, um, yeah. So I used the actual DSP that I built which is a digital signal processor built off of an FPGA and if you guys haven't played around with those, the entry points for those are very cheap. They're about uh, 60 to 70 dollars and you can, yeah, you can make, you can speed anything up that you need uh, to do. It's very, very cool systems and I would definitely recommend people getting into them, so. And there was a Beijing based uh, firm, so my setup that I'm going to go into uh, cost about $5,700. Everybody has, you know, extra $5,700 laying around, right? So, yeah, but the actual Beijing company, they got it down to $22, which is unbelievable. Um, so that's when it becomes, anybody can do it, so it's something where that's when it becomes scary and that's when people will start talking about it, press, uh, wired, did a very, very good write up on it. Um, they actually did a very good job with their talk and their slides if you guys are interested in their device and how it actually works. And uh, what I'm going to basically go over is the actual uh, hijack 
two-factor authentication. So who would like to have, uh, who is two-factor authentication on at least one of their electronic products? Yeah. <laughs> How would you like to add it to your car? How would you like to use like a 1356 ring you have or some people are putting implants in? There's lots of things that you can do for your uh, second form of verification. And yeah, and uh, how was this used? Uh, the passive key entry starts, the vehicle allows uh, the driver to actually lock the vehicle um, doors without touching the key. So when you get into proximity, there's uh, sensors in the roofs in most of them where it'll sense where you are at adjacent to the vehicle. So if you're in the back of the vehicle, you can't start it. If you're at the front of the vehicle, you can open the door, you can possibly start it. So these uh, remote key entry systems and the actual remote keyless ignitions. Uh, so the main frequencies for these, um, for as far as the US goes at least, um, you're in most likely one of these ranges, 314.9 uh, three to 315 or 433 megahertz. And then the 125 kilohertz is usually what the key is speaking for its low interrogation signal. So it doesn't have a lot of range, but it's basically gonna, you have a key in your pocket, it's gonna send out the 125 kilohertz and your vehicle is gonna send back 433 or 3, 315 depending on uh, what the actual make and model of it is. So yeah, and uh, Let's see here, yeah, so the actual key that I uh, was able to do the, some of the relay attacks on it was a 433 megahertz, and um, also I submitted all these to the, uh, the, the uh, actual uh, Cadillac and Chevy have, uh, or General Motors has an actual bug bounty program, and they informed me that they already knew about the amplification attacks, and I actually took a look at a lot of their systems, and they are uh, definitely stepping up their uh, uh, systems, and the most of it was fi uh, fixed by a lot of software patches, it's just a lot of the second, second hand vehicles in some cases didn't get it, so. It's definitely interesting, and uh, so those were the two that I actually was working on, because uh, they were in the 433 to 315 range, which was uh, within my sample range of the DSP that I built, so. And let's see, updated most vehicles. Yeah, like they have multi-roof sensors. Uh, Fiat Chrysler is an amazing company. They're uh, very open about talking to people in the security community. They had some uh, Jeep issues several years back, and they've been very, very good to the community, and they talk to people. They're very uh, good at reaching out and actually taking care of the issues, so. Yeah, so basically when you walk into range, you're detected by the door, the car opens. Um, you're sitting near the passenger door, the car won't start. Um, that was one of the uh, issues that I'm, I, I'm actually in my demo lab on Sunday. I will go into a little bit of how you can do something. It's basically beam forming, or you can make your uh, beacons appear as if they're coming from somewhere else inside the vehicle, or you can actually roll through a six foot, uh, about a six foot radius. You can uh, actually change it. And that was uh, something that I also used for some of the 802.11 attacks that I uh, did yesterday. So. And yeah, 2015, uh, it was at about, I said about a $5,400 setup. <laughs> and uh, 2016, it's, uh, you know, now I can uh, probably get around the same setup for about, I would say about $1,200 to $1,300. And uh, 2017 setup is about $300 to $22. So the uh, actual ones, uh, the attack surface is getting very, very cheap. And that's where um, some of these have been used in the wild. Uh, there's lots of you know, people, when it becomes in that $22 range, everybody can afford it. And it's, especially when plans are leaked or they're out there, so. Yeah, so how did I start this research? I uh, admired my neighbor's black Durango. <laughs> and I went over to my neighbor and uh, asked to borrow her uh, Durango. I was, uh, ran a wire from my driveway over to the Durango. And uh, yeah, basically explained to her that I was gonna see if I could drive around without the key in it. <laughs> And um, basically, you, you'll get glares for the rest of your life and you mow your lawn after you've uh, done stuff like this. So it's better to just go out and rent it or have a family member or, like I had a, a friend who had a, uh, another vehicle that would have been susceptible to it, so. But yeah, here's a little bit of the explanation of it. So you have a software-defined radio on one side, and this is the very expensive version of it. So basically, there was my driveway. I had an Edison 210 on that side, NSN 210 on this side. Um, I tried using the, U, uh, the USB versions uh, at that time when I was doing that, my USB 3 ports couldn't keep up with it, so I did a lot of troubleshooting and wasted a lot of time <laughs> getting it to work when I should have just went with the network versions of it. So ran a cable, did a cable test uh, first, and uh, here's the actual setup on the bottom. So I had uh, two Lenovo laptops, uh, N210s, and then uh, basically have to have a daughter card that's within that range, and you can tie in the DSP to the daughter card so you can actually uh, demodulate and remodulate it a lot faster, so, and yeah. Here's test two explained. So I did it over wireless uh, the second time. Um, it, it was susceptible to latency. Um, and that was, uh, I was checking into that and when, this is the actual results when I submitted it and everything like that. And uh, they were asking me if it was, a, it had an aftermarket starter added to it and stuff like that. So it might have added a little bit of susceptibility for that type of stuff for as far as uh, accepting the start. But as far as um, up to 18 milliseconds of latency is what I could add. So uh, to it where it would actually still accept it as a valid key entry. So. 
And yeah. So this is basically the same as the wired except for that we went with the wireless version of it. And here's my final test. So I did it over a 365 spectrum and uh, I did it from almost a quarter of a mile away. Uh, it was a Super Bowl Sunday like two years ago and I was uh, everybody else was watching the Super Bowl game. I don't even know who won that year or who's even playing because I was driving a, uh, a Durango around without the keys in it. So having a blast. <laughs> It's a very fun time, and uh, I, like I said, I have a whole setup. And like this was a little bit expensive, but uh, this one had really good range. Um, it worked on multiple keys, which is something that I'm, uh, from what I understand of the $22 version, is you can, uh, it's very uh, susceptible to interference and stuff like that. I could literally walk this one into a dealership, throw it down by the dealership rack, and uh, go off with any vehicle that's on the lot, uh, because it, because uh, of the way that it samples and the rates that it can sample at, it uh, is very, uh, it can take a lot of data before it'll actually start jamming it up or. Uh, basically garbling the messages, so. And yeah, uh, this is what I drove, uh, the ATM that I did my ATM hacking talk last year, so that was one of the vehicles that I did the br that performed uh, the attack on, so. And it was pretty fun, uh, it was, I loved the vehicles, they're um, amazing vehicles, but yeah, it was uh, the actual one that I performed the attack on, so. Or not this exact one, but it was a white Durango, so. But yeah, uh, so uh, the dealership, the, de or the actual digital to analog, analog to digital, uh, dealership attack, so that was like one of the proof of concepts that I submitted along with my um, uh, revul uh, vulnerability disclosure. It was, um, say for example, if somebody was to go into a dealership, they, dealerships, they have them hanging in a box inside of a wall inside of a manager somewhere. So if somebody was to drop the bag uh, near one of those, um, they would be able to actually walk off with several vehicles in some cases, um, uh, depending on the actual setup of it or how many keys there were. Um, there might have been a lot of confusion uh, depending on uh, how many of the interrogation signals and things were getting passed back and forth. So this actual attack, uh, so that would have been something where, you know, in addition to like rental returns, um, there was a couple other uh, concepts that I went through that were, would be possible, uh, especially in smaller cities, not like the bigger airports, they have the, you know, the strips where you wouldn't be able to drive them out and stuff like that, but yeah, so if you do the digital analog, analog to digital, so you're basically taking it from layer zero to layer one, back down to layer two, or down to layer one, or layer zero, excuse me. So, and yeah, uh, the, so the low frequency, so I used a Procmark, Procmark proxy, uh, which, um, who on here has dealt with those before, 1356? They're very, very nice. Uh, I've used them on RFID badges in the past, and it's something where um, the low interrogation signal that's sent off from the key fob, you're able to actually do, um, that one is a, a, a little bit less susceptible to some of the actual interference and things like that, so. But this was uh, part of the initial setup, so I had the Proxmark, and then I had that for all of the, uh, the actual LF or low channel uh, information, and then the for, the UHF uh, channels, it was 315, 433, uh, that was what I was tuned to, so anything out of that range, uh, like uh, I tried it on, um, there was a couple Ford vehicles, my wife has a Lincoln, uh, did not work on those, um, and I believe BMW was 868, so that was two of the frequencies, and these are the, these are the ones I didn't dive too much into them after I saw they didn't work, um, so those numbers might be inaccurate, or they might be for their actual FOB system, some of these vehicles might not have passive key entry at all, it's just the actual spectrums um, that they're actually using, so. So, and I'm not, I'm not saying that any of those are uh, susceptible 100%, but yeah, it's something where uh, it's cool to see how they've actually done reactions ever since the 2009-2010 research, because they published their research in 2009 for the amplification attack, and uh, the actual attack surface for that went down uh, pretty severely, so. And yeah, so uh, Roller Jam, uh, that's something that Sammy Kamkar did last year, uh, basically blocks um, uh, your message, and then it'll uh, allow it to relay, or replay play it a second time once you play the second. Thing. It's very, very cool. You should go check it out. Um, that's one of the features that I'm actually building into uh, the stop mitigation method. It's actually going to stop because um, you have a two-factor authentication on the device that I'm building. Um, so you'll actually be able to detect if there's any roller jamming going on. Uh, so that one will do a signaling. Um, and I'll show you the actual Adreno method. If you guys want to go to the um, uh, demo labs, I'll actually go into greater detail. Uh, I could literally talk for a half an hour about that uh, specifically. So. But yeah, it's gonna add, uh, there's other uh, key attacks, there's some, some uh, Genesis code attacks, like from dealership codes and stuff like that, where uh, people are able to do some other things. So you'll be able to detect if anybody's trying to attack your vehicle wirelessly, and uh, adding, adding features as they develop, and I'd love to see what the community has to do. Um, one of the biggest ones is I have a, I don't have a stock infotainment system in my computer, I have an aftermarket CD player, it's an Android uh, CD player, so I actually have a Bluetooth uh, radio on that one, so I can actually, basically tied into the uh, jamming frequency. My uh, vehicle that I have is a 95, it's an older vehicle, but it still has a 1356 chip in the ignition, so it still has some kind of wireless that I can jam to actually pass, or de-auth, uh, a jamming would be illegal, so. But it's something where you can actually uh, take care of the actual wireless beacons and it won't be able to actually uh, pass off to the immobilizer and you won't be able to start the vehicle. Uh, they will be able to, 
uh, with certain other instances. There still are by bypasses that people can do uh, to steal vehicles and disable them. So, but basically, it's a time lock option. So you can. Um, this one is a built-in uh, time frame. So, like for the the beta one that I did, I did from uh, the hours that I'm sleeping, basically. Or I can actually do when my plug get, my phone gets plugged in. Anytime my phone gets plugged in, uh, it'll turn on a certain beacon. Or you can do whatever you want for as far as your trigger for it. Uh, you could uh, eventually have an Android phone hooked up to it, and in certain parts of town, you'll just lock your uh, jam your vehicle's uh, actual authentication. So there's plenty of methods, and I would love to see what the actual hacker community can come up with for this. But you're basically adding two-factor authentication. So if you're um, deauthenticating about a foot radius, depending on the TX code or the actual TX strength, excuse me. Uh, depending on your broadcast strength, you can take care of basically your van or your uh, your uh, vehicle area network. So it's going to everything that's in proximity to your vehicle. You're not going to be stopping other vehicles, um, in most cases. So that's other ways you can do is you can just actually disrupt the uh, CAN bus method. Or there's a lot of ways that you can disrupt the actual starting of the vehicle. Um, I don't think radio jamming would be necessarily the best one, but it's one that uh, was the first one that came to mind, and it seems to be the simplest uh, where it gets you in that eleven dollar range. Um, some of the other methods would involve uh, having to buy um, proprietary ports or at least um, Chinese knockoffs of them. So, and yeah, you can basically disrupt the, uh, the infotainment system. You could do a pin. That's one that I would recommend dealerships do or uh, um, actual uh, auto manufacturers. So maybe they leave the uh, keyless doors being able to be opened, but they add some kind of thing where you can uh, opt in to have your vehicle have a four digit pad pin to actually. Uh, get your immobilizer or some, some kind of thing to actually stop these kind of attacks. And I hope that they uh, handle it uh, with a little bit more security in mind. So, and uh, I have a USB based in, uh, infotainment jammer. So that one is uh, one where um, you can basically uh, still get into your doors, you can still unlock your vehicle um, depending on the makes and models. Um, some of them that have, uh, are non wired for the actual keyless entry, you wouldn't work on that. And uh, yeah, so you'll be able to detect, like I was saying, a lot of the actual spoofing, um, plastic slip for your key fob. Uh, there's actual modifications I'm doing for the actual fobs for uh, the Fiat Chrysler vehicles where you can actually uh, basically slide a piece of plastic up on the side and it actually uh, covers the actual internal battery uh, portion of it. So yeah, so there's lots of actual ways that people could stop this. I know a lot of people were like, oh, put your key in an electro electrostatic bag or inside of a Faraday cage or something along those lines. And yeah, I definitely wouldn't uh, see that as being something convenient, but I think adding a second factor such as having your f uh, phone and Bluetooth uh, would definitely be something that would be simple to use. So basically, it uh, jams 433 or 315. Uh, not necessarily jams it. It can deauth it. It can you know take care of those radio signals, however they're saying. But it effectively adds a two-factor authentication to your vehicle. So if you're jamming 315 uh, megahertz, it's not going to jam 2.4 gigahertz, which is that your Bluetooth or whatever uh, your secondary wireless beacons actually going to be in range. And you could literally have it as simple as something. Um, there's uh, Bluetooth low energy. You could have it. Uh, there's lots of devices that actually put off these. So you could have a watch to start your car. It's amazing. I just have it. At, uh, the idea and the concept is actually to stop this attack, and it was to build some kind of uh, two-form authentication. That's uh, it's really really fun when you have something that's in your vehicle that works with your vehicle. So, and it's uh, a really really fun project. It's really cheap and uh, it takes about two hours to build. So, and yeah, like I was saying, you could do the actual eight eight p.m. to five a.m. That's what I do for mine. Uh, if I needed to actually go to work in between here and there, I still have ways that I can do it. I can go in there and I can actually do workarounds or. Um, if some days, if yeah, it's just as simple as modifying it. Uh, there's a very, very simple file, and I'll be releasing all these open source MIT license, so everybody can just literally grab this. They can throw it into products. I hope the uh, actual companies um, offer these some kind of these kind of things. I would think that would be awesome, and it would be nice. And it would uh, for the years that aren't covered, though, it's nice to be able to actually build something from the ground up. And yeah, and as simple clock control. So the simple clock control one. So they're the one that's windowing just for shutting your vehicle down at certain hours. Uh, that one is very cheap to build. I built that one for uh, less than six dollars. So, and I'll be releasing all the plans for those uh, a little after DEF CON. And uh, yeah, using the actual jammer to, to steal vehicles. So this is another proof of concept. This is something dealerships need to watch out for. Uh, so I was like, okay, if people can build uh, three, uh, 433 jammers, 315 jammers, uh, they could basically go to a car dealership, walk up to a salesman, be like, hey, I'd like to purchase this vehicle. Then they'll go over to the vehicle. The vehicle won't open. What is the first thing the salesman does? He walks to go get a jump starter, then they just turn off the jammer and walk off of it. So that's something where I think the, the automotive manufacturers need to put some kind of jam tracking in there, some kind of light, some kind of indicator, uh, something on the key fobs. Um, it's definitely something that I don't think this is going to go away. Um, it's something where they might get more advanced. Um, like I was saying, I never thought that they'd be able to get it down to $22. If you would have funded me a uh, million dollars, I wouldn't have been able to get it down to the small form factor that they did it. So it's something where 
you know, with a little bit of research put into it, people are able to get it to that where now it's available in everybody's hands. So, and yeah, actually, a couple other cool projects I was working on. I mentioned some of these uh, TPMS sensors, so the tire pressure monitor sensors. I actually have one for. Um, uh, so I had a buddy who races Mustangs, and he hates having his dash flashing while he's at the drag strip or whatever. So he switches switches his tires out, and he has to go have his vehicle flash every time. Uh, so basically, I wrote a a program or a modification that you can do to actual uh, uh, Ford and Lincoln vehicles uh, from uh, somewhere around 2007 up. You'll be able to actually modify the TPMS IDs, so you can have three sets of tires on your vehicle. And this one uh, only, only works for Ford and Lincoln. If there's interest in other stuff, uh, maybe other people in the community want to reach out to me, we can do it for other vehicles. I don't think other vehicles are as hard to actually flash over. I haven't actually researched it, though. So we're on five minutes. Awesome. Yeah, I should be wrapped up here soon. And uh, yeah, so the random TPMS ID. So every time you start your vehicle, I have the, <laughs> this is one of the, uh, um, the security talks I did uh, yesterday. It was actually, every time your vehicle starts, it flashes your TPMS sensors, so it does random numbers, basically. And it actually uh, uh, loads them into your ECU and everything for you. So it does everything that the dealership does, except for every time you drive around, you're not being able to be tracked by billboards. And it's gonna get more and more intrusive in the future. People are gonna be, literally be uh, using these. I know uh, over in other countries, they've even used uh, TPMS sensors for uh, you know, IEDs and other things. So there's lots of ways that if people were able to actually shut their actual sensors off of their vehicles um, without the actual dash lights going off or being able to add at least like three, uh, three sets of tires to their vehicles, it would be something that they'd be very interested in. And if you guys have any questions about any of these, I will also be talking about these at the, um, the actual demo labs on Sunday because I can drive into a little bit deeper detail. You can ask some of the, the more uh, questions that you want to roll. So. And yeah, so basically the random rolls of the TPMS sensors, um, cycle throughs, um, 10 revisions is what I have the, the Lincoln model working for. Uh, so it'll actually, every time you start, it'll roll through one of 10. So basically it has 10 sets of tires att attached to your vehicle and it uh, does draw a little more energy so you can wirelessly charge it. So uh, if people aren't a fan of putting more things into their tires, that might be something that they might want to refrain from or uh, have some kind of actual uh, kinetic energy system to run it. And uh, early warrant detection system. Uh, this is one that I came up with about two weeks before I came to DEF CON, actually. And it's actually, um, there's um, on certain, so when somebody served a warrant, uh, they basically have to, for the most part, they have to serve a uh, empty dump truck to their house and actually uh, load the trash in that way. So, and it was something, it was just a proof of concept. And I just, uh, I reached out to a couple of the uh, actual manufacturers to see if it's something that they care about, because there are load, uh, either from the airbag distributions, and it's something that, I know there's a couple people that have done research on actual uh, loads for armored trucks to be able to tell how, uh, uh, just by how they're riding, how much actual stuff is inside of them. So it's something where they need to actually maybe lock down a little bit on some of the wireless sensors in this case. So, but yeah, I'm gonna open up to questions and then we got like maybe like two minutes left, something like that. So yeah, does anybody have any questions or? Yes. Uh, targeted ro remote jammers for as far as. Like if you were pointing a high gain antenna at a car, jamming the uh, frequency. <laughs> it's accidentally happened. Uh, there was an instance in New York where uh, somebody's AV equipment actually jammed, I think it was like three and a half miles of vehicle starting that had. Yeah. So it's gotten a lot better since then. That was early. That was early adopters right there, I think. So, so. they not have to accept all interference intended and unintended? Um, <laughs> uh, and some of the newer ones, they possibly do have some of the, I, I know they definitely worked a lot of the kinks out of the uh, original ones. So you're talking for which, which spectrum? Or if you want to ask me on the hallway, we can probably do that or maybe. I was a, just curious if that historically happened already. Yet. Okay, yeah, I, I think it has. And uh, I've heard of instances in New York. So yes. Anybody else have any other questions or, yes? Yeah, yeah. Did you experience some, some, well, setbacks? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you, when you drive around, it will, uh, uh, the vehicle that I was driving around without the key, it did beep every few miles. And then once I got it out of drive, it did uh, notify me every time. But I was able to drive pretty much until I turned the vehicle off. So, in that instance, and then, uh, what was the first half of the question? Well, Um, yes, yeah, some of them are throttled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a thin line that they're dancing on with that right now because it's uh, what if somebody, you know, uh, is, is hurt or injured and their vehicle uh, would not be able to drive them to the hospital. That, you know, defeats the rate of, you know, people or the actual NICB or whatever the, 
the ratings that their vehicles will get from being stolen a lot. So if it gets to be a bigger issue, I'm hoping that they will actually include something like this as an add-on. Because uh, like I said, the Bluetooth version is very, very simple. And if they could have actual output from their um, infotainment systems, um, it would be something that would be, even if it was a secondary device, um, it's something that uh, there still are ways to fix this. And I haven't found any utility or any kind of patenting that would make it where uh, they wouldn't, it would stop them from doing anything like that. So it's not like one uh, brand of vehicle has anything like that. So any other questions or? Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for your guys' time and thanks for listening. So.